Welcome to The Dental Brief, the world's direct, right-to-the-point podcast produced to get you the information you need to learn and grow your practice. To learn more about our guests and find links to information discussed on our show, visit our website, dentalbrief.com. On to today's episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Dental Brief. I have with us today our guest, uh, Amber Riley. Amber, say hello. Hello. Hello, Patrick. Hello, we, audience, listening audience. We are so excited to have you here. So uh, you're calling us from sunny San Diego, correct? That's right. Yeah. It is so, sunny. <laughs> yeah, always. Tell us a little bit about your um, your background. Well, I'm not a native to San Diego. I actually uh, was born and raised in a Southern Ohio, Dayton, Ohio. And I completed both of my undergraduate degrees in Ohio. My, uh, I'm a dental hygienist, and I completed my associate's degree in dental hygiene at Sinclair College in Dayton. And then I finished my bachelor's at Wright State University. And um, my master's is uh, from Boston University, actually. So evidently prefer the cold weather in the first part of my life. <laughs> Tell us how you got into dentistry. I, I, you know, my, one of my earliest mentors for dentistry and dental hygiene was my hygienist. And uh, my parents are still patients of the practice that we all went to when I was growing up. Um, And it was her that actually first planted the seed in my ear about considering dental hygiene, because I, I thought, and I had felt that I wanted to go into nursing And uh, I have worked from the age of 14 as a volunteer at the local hospital. And then when I got out of high school, I took a job as a billing clerk and receptionist at a family medical practice. And I had, in those years, had actually begun to see that nursing maybe wasn't the best fit for me. I knew clinically I was able to do the work, but what I was seeing was a lot of fatigue and dissatisfaction and a lack of joy in the nurses that I was working with. A lot of bad uh, health habits, a lot of smokers, uh, obesity. Um, and and uh, and I talked to Mary, who was my hygienist, about this. And she said, and she just had this amazing effervescent personality. She was one of those genetically just happy people. So she was such a wonderful ambassador for hygiene. Uh, And she said, well, Amber, what about dental hygiene? And she goes, have you ever thought about it? And I said, no. (laughs) And she goes, well, you know, I, I, she goes, the money's great. The hours are great. I've never had a patient die on me. (laughs) Uh, And, uh, and she had graduated from the hygiene program, which was a, a, is a community college in Dayton, Ohio. The one that I was going to Um, with nursing prep and all of the classes were exactly the same, all the anatomy, physiology, chemistry, biology, everything was exactly the same for hygiene as it was for nursing. And so I didn't lose any ground at all. I just kind of walked across the hallway and it was such a profoundly excellent decision. I've I've credited credited her for that uh, for my 22 years now that I've been a hygienist. Um, that that she planted that seed. And hopefully I've done that for some of my patients as well uh, that have asked me about um, my job and what I do and how I got into it. I've, I've wanted to, to, to pay back what Mary did for me to a number of patients that I've seen over the years that ask questions. That's fantastic. And this is where things are going to get interesting. Your career has evolved quite a bit. It has. <laughs> it definitely and, and- has. Now you're a forensic dental consultant. Yes. Tell me a little bit about that. How did you how did you end up on this path, and how did you take your career to where it's at? Now? That, that is a, that's interesting. Um, I am a I'm a forensic dental consultant for the county of San Diego, which is where I live now, the office of the chief medical examiner. Um, and then I I did consulting work in King County and Kitsap County, where I used to live in Washington, and so that started uh, with a very Again, those seeds, when you plant seeds, you never know uh, who in the audience is, is that seed's going to grow for. And I was just an undergrad student in, uh, this was an oral pathology professor. 
and Stephen Holliday uh, is his name. And he's, I believe he's still teaching at Sinclair. He had a patient that he treated and she was a missing person. So the police had contacted him as her dentist of record and asked him for her most recent dental records because the body had been recovered that uh, was believed to be her. And there was the body was severely decomposed and there was um, long lost quicker things like fingerprints. And there was no DNA at that time uh, that we could rapidly analyze. And he provided dental records and, and it was her. And what he showed in the class, what I know now, what he showed in the class, he is the treating dentist should have never had these, the scene photos. <laughs> uh, the forensic dentist may have the scene photos, but not the treating dentist. But regardless of that, um, I was fascinated because the condition of her remains had transformed remarkably. And this was a, this was a very petite Filipino female. And the condition of the remains was an extremely dark, large, bloated looking. It looked like a male, but it was her teeth and his excellent dental records that made her identification uh, without a doubt. It was absolutely her and uh, her case could be closed and the investigation can then proceed as to what happened to her. Was it, um, did she you know, come into harm? Was this an accident or whatever? Um, and I was just blown away with it, just the, um, the unique interest in it. And so uh, I, <laughs> I had a patient, I'm always good with networking with my patients. So <laughs> I have a patient that was an FBI agent. And so I called him up. And I said, hey, Joe, <laughs> I said, who do you know in the Montgomery County uh, Coroner's Department, which is the county that I lived in at the time? And he said, I know everybody. Why? What did you do? <laughs> and so um, I, I asked, I told him I had, uh, I had taken a, an interesting class at that point at um, a local dental society meeting on forensic dentistry. And, uh, and so I was interested enough uh, to, to just find out a little bit more about it at that time, not knowing that dental hygienists were not very big players or players practically at all at the time in forensics. Um, but Joe vouched for me for the at the coroner's department, and he hooked me up with medical investigator, which is a death investigator, sure. uh, who was a nurse. She was a nurse and she had left uh, nursing to go into full-time death investigation. So she took me under her wing and um, I was able to observe an autopsy from very, very, very far away <laughs> where I really didn't see anything that was going. But I was interested. And, and I have been extremely fortunate that I've been mentored and, and um, lifted up it, every step of the way. And that's not been the case for, for everyone. Sometimes in forensics, there can be some territoriality and... Um, and it's not a full-time job. Forensics is forensic dental identification is something that's truly as needed. Sure. I mean, in, in San Diego County, we're a little bit more busy because it's a very densely populated county. And we're also bordered. Um, right. So we handle Imperial County and San Diego County. Um, and so there's a higher number of undocumented uh, remains um, which we don't have a lot of leads for that may come over. Um, but we still treat everyone as if they're ours. Um, so we have a, a larger Jane and John Doe work in San Diego County than else other counties that I've serviced in the past. Um, but it's a fun course to teach. It's a fun program to teach because if I have a room of 300 people that just have a really basic interest in forensic dentistry, and that's why they're coming, then if I can drop that seed in just two or three ears, you know, those two or three people hopefully are going to go back to their office and make sure their dental records <laughs> that they're keeping are up to date, sure. that um, you know, they, that they're not purging dental records without some kind of a, a digital manifest, um, saving, saving the treatment records, saving most recent radiographs, that kind of thing. Um, 
because it's I've, I've the oldest case that I personally worked on um, where a dental record was required. It was out of L.A. County and it was a 32 year cold case. And there was an endodontist that had kept a PA from like 1982 or 1983. And from his records analog film that came in an envelope, <laughs> uh, we, we made a positive identification. So that's my that's, plea is hold your records, please hold your records. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, that's fascinating. What you do is fascinating. Um, and I'm going to kind of shift gears here a little bit, um, for what we had discussed, uh, prior to uh, starting to record this episode. Um, I know that you do work with um, Oral Cancer Foundation, um, and you have in the past. I know that you believe um, greatly in giving back, um, which is part of the reason why you're on our show here today. Um, you're talking about some subjects that are sad, frankly, right? They can be somewhat dark. And yeah, I, how do you um, how do you maintain that happiness that you clearly have, um, and how, that positive energy? And then how in this you know, this in dentistry, we know that um, job satisfaction is not very high. Um, that's connected to a lot of things. How can you help our audience with that? How can you lift everyone's spirits here today? You know, you're you're absolutely right, Patrick. I have seen it. I have seen job dissatisfaction in dentistry and dental hygiene throughout my career. I've I've worked for and with some very unhappy, dissatisfied professionals, and the common thread that I have recognized and in myself as well, I've been through periods of professionally where I was lacking satisfaction sure. uh, was uh, the, it's the rut. It's the pressure of a schedule and it's the pressure of, of what our production needs to be. Dentistry is a business. I know it is. I believe in it. Uh, I believe in uh, a productive practice, but sometimes those numbers can just be uh, a noose around our neck. And I have found that the when that is the overall driving force and that we get so tunneled into doing exactly the same thing, the same way, every single day, four or five days a week, 45 minutes, one hour, 45 minutes, one hour, it's, it's very unhappy. And you still find yourself not making those numbers or not making them enough. And um, I found, I have found some of the greatest joy in, in uh, continuing to learn. I have found and bringing that knowledge back into my, my hour with my patient or my 50 minutes with my patient or sharing it with my coworkers. Uh, I could have stopped with just my undergraduate degrees and had a, you know, a, a full career as a hygienist, uh, but I built on that and I branched out on that. And uh, pathology was is um, was an area that I was drawn to it very early on. Not even my first year out of dental hygiene school, uh, I had a patient with a young woman with a, an extremely concerning lesion under her tongue, 32, 33 years old, married, mother of two. Um, this is, this is what we know is kind of the seven or 8% of oral cancer victims, oral cancer patients that probably did not have any kind of a lifestyle or risk associated with it. Sure. Um, even though she was like a, a, a closet smoker, maybe had two or three cigarettes in a month, and it was the situation of don't tell my husband he thinks I stopped. Those right. two or three cigarettes, clinically we know, was was not contributing to this. You know, even if she had like a fifth of vodka a day, two or three cigarettes, um, and HPV that young, she's in that seven percent of really aggressive, very difficult to treat oral cancers. She had we had referred her for a biopsy. She didn't go. Didn't see her in the office again for about 18 months. She came back in and this time there was, you didn't need a biopsy to know what it was. And she died. 
and it um, it affected me profoundly on obviously the patient always has the autonomy to to follow through with your recommendations or not we referred her she didn't go that's her choice right. but but i was thrust into the mindset of thinking i i need to be better educated about this so that i can educate my patients more about this i don't want to catch a patient that's already in stage four when she's 33 years old in my chair i want to catch it when it's a suspicious lesion something a concerning uh, a concerning lesion that's not going away and all the tools that we have available to us now as clinicians that I didn't have 22 years ago or that were just in their infancy and that now should be the standard of evaluation in our general practices. A hygienist is the perfect team member for these technical technological advancements. We spend the most time with the patients. I have the longest time outside of a crown prep. I have the longest time with the patients. They're seeing me three, four times a year, some, some patients five times a year. And that's an hour-ish of time that I have with them that I can teach them, that I can talk to them, that I can really get to know their medical history. Um, there are there is a rapid test that is in development that I am reading about that I'm hoping the FDA will clear by 2021. They're a little busy right now. Right, yeah. <laughs> so I'm giving them that. Just a bit tied up, yeah. But I mean, we're talking, <laughs> it's a rapid test for the tumor initiating and stem cell associated biomarkers that wow. we, have, we are clinically, we have validated that are strongly associated with oral cancers. And when I say a rapid test, I'm talking 10 minutes. 10, 15 minutes. And to think how we could bring that into dentistry, a rapid test, do your profi, do your perio maintenance. Um, then you have your oral cancer, intraoral, extraoral cancer screenings, and then the adjunct technologies that are available. I'm not uh, sponsored or anything by any of these companies that I'm going to uh, bring up for this this podcast, but think of Velscope, think of uh, Oral ID, which is a product by Forward Science, the Visilite Pro, which is a Denmat product. All of these use a non-ionizing um, natural tissue fluorescence technology to help our eyes see better. And this is invigorating to me. This is exciting to me as a clinician. This is one of those things that pulls me out of the rut, that can pull a listener out of their rut to think that you are more than just, uh, you know, the tooth doctor. You're more than just the cleaning lady, the cleaning person. I hate that term. Good Lord. <laughs> I'm here just for a cleaning. Let me tell you something. <laughs> no, you're not. You know, Amber, let me let me share um, an, a personal an experience um, from being in the chair is, you know, the dentist um, that I go to now is I consider him a friend. Um, I have been going there for quite some time. His hygienist is amazing. Um, she's just really fantastic. And, and kind of before that, I hopped around from dentist to dentist to dentist to dentist. Yeah. Right. And um, in at my current dentist office. The, the hygienist there, Michelle, that I was shocked at my first visit, the oral cancer screening exam that she did. Like, I was actually like, what are you doing? Like, I kind of felt like she dropped like a valuable small diamond in my mouth and was searching for it. And she, uh -huh. she looked at me kind of like an oral screening exam, but like, you know, haven't you met at the dentist before? And the, the point that I'm, I'm trying to make here is that it made a it made a connection with me of caring and that this was more than certainly a cleaning or that your teeth, um, your oral health is much more tied to your overall health um, than I had kind of believed before. And it was all just because of this exam. Now, I will tell you, since I built a relationship with this entire team, including the hygienist, that it's important to her. Like it's it's. Wow extremely important to her. People's health is very important to her and it shows and it's made me take my oral health care to a whole nother level just from that, just from that alone. So 
Oh, yeah. uh, can you speak to that a little bit? I know we're kind of going over here on time a little bit, but can you, yeah. can you talk with your experience about that uh-huh. and how important this is to have hygiene really step it up to the highest level of uh, service and care possible and what oh, that I does for practices, bottom line? I could give you three hours on that <laughs> standing on my head. But yes, again, this goes back to, I mean, I love your experience because that tells me that you were hopping around, whether you knew it or not, you were dental, you were office shopping because you were not satisfied with the level of care that you were getting. And the fact that you had to ask your hygienist, Michelle, what she was doing clearly indicates you were not getting an oral cancer screening at the offices that you were at prior or just, you know, whipping your tongue out and looking for a half a second on each side does not constitute an oral cancer screening. Sure. Uh, and absolutely, I'll spend a lot of time on a patient's medical history because that medical history is critically important to how I treatment plan a patient. It is critically important to know the status of systemic health or systemic disease in a patient that I want to and expect to recover from their periodontal disease or their dental disease. They're going to have extractions. They're going to have implants that require bony integration. They have a a teeming infectious disease in their mouth that is permeating bacteria and cytokines and histamines throughout their body. That is a sick patient. They're sitting in your chair and they're sick. I have one part of expertise that I am going to get them back on the road towards health and safety, but you have to have at least a working knowledge of basic pathophysiology to really integrate health with oral health. I don't, I always want to reprogram a new patient that comes in and they, and dentistry is very separate to them. The ones, if they say it's just a cleaning, I've got a lot of work to do with that patient. And it takes time. Can't do it in one hour. Can't do it, um, you know, sometimes it takes a couple of years to really win them over. Some patients can't win over. Uh, but I uh, I have listened to a number of your dental briefs. And I have listened to a number of friends and colleagues that you have inter- interviewed uh, over over time. And one of the most recent ones was uh, Dr. Hazel Glasper. Mm-hmm. And uh, I love her. I love her message. I love her work. She is incredibly talented and she's an artist. But she and I are both members of AOSH. Um, and she mentioned that on her podcast as well. And that is... It's a still relatively newer type of an association, but it's the understanding that there's collaboration between oral health and physical health. And I teach that it is just health. Your oral health is not separate from what's going on uh, in the rest of your of your body. Your diabetes absolutely matters when I'm treatment planning a periodontal protocol for you. Sure. Your your um, osteoporosis absolutely matters when we are scheduling for implants. Yes, 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 it does. And so it we, to get a better collaboration of medicine on our side, sometimes we have to go out and teach or introduce all the ways that dentistry and oral medicine and dental hygiene benefit medicine. If they're not coming to us, then we can go to them. You know, go to the, the medical practice that's in your neighborhood. Go to your family doctor, your nurse practitioner, your integrative medicine specialist, and talk to them and teach them about everything that dentistry can do and dental hygiene can do for their patients and to use us as a referral source. It's, it's, uh, it's still kind of a novel concept. Uh, and I, my audience is, I have physicians and nurses and allied health professionals from um, many, many different uh, branches of, of healthcare and medicine. Um, but on these collaborative topics, oral pathology, oral cancer affects the body. Of course. Diabetes affects the mouth. It's, it's to stop the teaching that, you know, it's a tooth doctor <laughs> or a doctor doctor that that's antiquated it's false um that collaboration with with dentistry and medicine is 
that is the 21st century. That is the that is the integration of my profession of dentistry with nursing, with integrative health. Um, I have, Mayo, you know, I have a patient. When I have a patient that comes to me because their doctor sent them, their medical doctor sent them to the hygienist, sure. that is a motivated patient. They can't get on a kidney transplant list until they have a clean bill of health from their dentist. What? What's this about? Oh, let me tell you what it's about. <laughs> Um, Amber, that, that excites uh, me. That is yeah, the humdrum. Yeah, and it is it is it is exciting. A lot of people don't think about it that, that way, but I think when you dive Ooh. into it, um, it is. Um, Amber, your website is decoeducation.com, correct? D E C O education.com. And yeah. you do uh, consulting, continued education classes, um, yeah. all over the place, really. Um, I highly invite our audience to check it out. Um, see where she's going to be next, where you can plug in, where you can connect, where you can learn more. Um, Amber, I'll give you the, I want to thank you very much for coming on the show. And I'll give you the last, uh, I'll give you the last word. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, Patrick. This has been uh, a pleasure. It's just felt like a conversation with an old friend and uh, my hats off to your hygienist, Michelle. <laughs> thank you for that girl. Toe the line. Um, I would, uh, I would appreciate everyone if, when you have a moment, uh, because the uh, the Oral Cancer Foundation is uh, near and dear to me. I am um, one of the dental hygiene uh, advisory members for the Oral Cancer Foundation. That's oralcancerfoundation.org. It's a 5013 nonprofit. Um, I certainly am not taking any kind of uh, money or a vested interest whatsoever, um, other than getting education out. They do advocacy. They support my my practices with educational material, but resources as well. And they fund research. Um, think about them on Giving Tuesday if you're looking for a, a place to make a qualified charitable donation. I would certainly recommend them. Um, I appreciate your time. Uh, and we've certainly crossed a couple of gamuts of, uh, of my my wild and diverse dental hygiene career. But I, it's kept me very motivated. It's kept me excited. And uh, I've met just tremendous people, a tremendous number of people along the way professionally. So but plant your seeds. And I, I was uh, I had seeds planted in me that that I've that I've taken um, in directions probably that uh, I really couldn't have foreseen even a decade ago. So if you're out there, plant your seeds. And grow Amber, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll share the link for the Oral Cancer Foundation on thank our you. site. Thank you. Um, and on our social media as well. Again, thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you for joining us on today's episode. Did you know you can weigh in on today's topic on Facebook? Search The Dental Brief on Facebook or visit our website, dentalbrief.com, and just follow the link. We look forward to having you join us again on another episode of The Dental Brief.